Okay, um, first thing I want to say is thank you very much to the foundation for inviting me to speak. I, I was just saying before the uh, coming up here that at the beginning of the week I was speaking to students in a unlit, you know, basement without windows and now here I am in a very glitzy venue which is not my normal habitat but I will, I will do my best. So I'm a professor of sociology and sociological practice. The practice is important to me because I see sociology as a craft. It's about doing things. And part of the doing for me is storytelling. Capturing the stories from other people and relaying those stories in a way that we can gain some insights um, and some information that helps us uh, improve the lives of others. So I tell these stories and I'm going to tell some uh, a few stories today. So the first story I'll begin with you can see on the screen is a respondent to one of my uh, studies and his name is Ken. This photograph was taken in 1964 when Ken was 17. He actually looks much older, but he was 17 at the time. Ken took part in a study looking at young people's transitions from school to work in Leicester in the English Midlands. And this study captured all aspects of young people's lives, from what they spent their money on, to their careers, to their jobs, to their aspirations, even down to what they would do if they won a huge amount of money. Now, based on this information, there were various predictions made for the young people that participated in that study. So for Ken, it would be that he would make a linear transition from education to work, that he would occupy a working class job, a working class career throughout his lifetime. And typically he would stay in that job for life. Now I had the good fortune to re-interview Ken uh, when Ken was uh, approaching retirement. And I asked him to talk about his life. I wanted to understand the extent to which the predictions made for him came true. I will say, Ken didn't make a simple, easy transition from school to work. His transition was complicated. He had various periods of unemployment. He had periods in temporary work. He had periods in part-time work, doing a variety of different things. He stayed at home with his parents for quite some time. Um, he didn't um, form a family unit until quite some time after the original interview. And you get the idea. It wasn't straightforward. It wasn't simple. It wasn't easy. But when we look at all the literature that's written about youth employment in the 1960s, particularly in the UK, the idea is that somehow it was straightforward, it was easy for young people then. There were lots of jobs and it was easy to get into those jobs. Yet Ken's story tells us that that's not quite the case, it's not quite true. I will come back to Ken later in the presentation. So I want to say a little bit about myself, a detour via myself. This is a, a quote from a paper that I wrote on my intersection between sociology and biography. I've often thought about my journey to and subsequently through the discipline and how it came to be that a working class school failure from a mining community in North Derbyshire ended up becoming a sociologist. 
although the writing of the previous sentence alludes to the origins of my becoming, looking back, I'm clear that I've been a sociologist as long as I can remember. Now, there are two bits to this, two parts to this. I left school with no qualifications at all. I went to a school that essentially provided young workers that would either go into the mining and coal industry or would go into steel manufacture further north. I left school at a time when the pits were being closed on the back of the miners' strike in the early to mid 1980s. The prospects for me and my cohort looked pretty bleak at that time. I say that I was interested in George Orwell and when I say on the screen it's the only thing I took from school, I mean that quite literally. I had a set of George Orwell books and I kept them. I never returned them. Don't, maybe you shouldn't be admitting this now, but I, I kept them, I kept them. And these were really formative to me. Reading an author who spoke in a way or wrote in a way that I could understand, that I could access, actually gave me the desire to find out more, the desire to um, pursue education and to try and understand a little bit more about the situation of particularly the working class. I'm influenced by the sociologist C. Wright Mills and these intersections of history and biography. So it's no coincidence that I'm interested in the school to work transition process because it's a process by any measure I failed at the time. I did not make a, a successful transition. And so for me, my biography has been the starting point for a lot of the research that I've done. I want to understand about my experience, I want to understand about the experiences of my uh, community. Norbert Elias, I'm not sure how well known Norbert Elias is in Portugal, but this is a sociologist, a social theorist, that tells us that to understand where we are now, we have to look back. We have to look backwards. And I'll come more on to that. And then there are two other uh, uh, projects that I'll talk about. One is the Young Worker Project that, that Ken was a part of, and another sociologist that nobody will have heard of, Pearl Jeffcott. And I'll talk a little bit about her. So as Mills says, what's important is not the details of one's past, although you should be aware of them, but it's how one interprets them and what rules for the present and the future one draws from them. So my experience of leaving school with no qualifications has been absolutely central to trying to understand and unpick um, this transition process, the complexities that young people experience when leaving full-time education and moving out into the wider world. For anybody that's interested in doing this kind of research, read C. Wright Mills. Mills is a fantastic author. It's about an orientation. He provides you with a set of tools through which to interpret the social world. But he starts with yourself. You need to understand your personal troubles in the context of public issues. So my orientation. I ask, or I'm oriented towards sociogenetic questions. That's how academics speak for how did this come to be? How did this happen? How did I get here? It was very interesting talk, playing Talking Heads earlier. The song Road to Nowhere. That's not my beautiful wife. That's not my beautiful car. How did I get here? How did I get to this point? So how does this come to be, whatever this is. Towards relational questions, how are these things interrelated? Now again, I'll just pause on that. It's not how variable A impacts on variable B. It's how they all relate together. 
if we're interested in young people's experiences of the transition process, it's not useful to only focus on one aspect. It could be employment. We need to understand these as wholes, as totalities, in a more holistic way. How are these related? How are transitions to work from education linked to community, to class, to family, to housing, uh, to relationships, and so on? So it's what ways are these interrelated? I've talked about the history, in sections of history and biography, and it's really that idea about how kind of intellectual ideas relate to you as a person that's key. The other thing I would say as a sociologist, and anybody who's familiar with kind of academic sociology or uh, academic studies of education or social policy or whatever, we often fall into the trap of forgetting that we are talking about people. So there's a nice quote from Joke Hardsblom. Unfortunately, it's not superfluous to remind ourselves that in sociology, we are dealing with people. All too often, sociologists start with an abstract conception of social action or social system. It makes sense, therefore, to state quite explicitly we are concerned with people. People often get overlooked when we talk about abstract ideas like social class or community. Politicians talk about voters or participants. But what we're talking about really, what we're engaging with really, are people. People are at the centre of this. It's not about class as an abstract concept. It's not about race and ethnicity as an abstract concept. It's about how people themselves experience life. We have to keep people at the centre of, of all that we do and all that we think about. Okay, you all with me so far? Okay, good, thank you. So I've got a, a number of challenges that we, we experience and that we need to think about. When we are thinking about the problem of youth, the problems of youth, we need to think about three challenges. The first one is the problem of now. So the title of my talk was Youth Through Time. And as I've mentioned already, my orientation is to try to understand how things come to be. So the problem of now. So this is the sociologist Norbert Elias that I've mentioned. The immediate present into which sociologists are retreating constitutes just one momentary phase within the vast stream of humanity's development, which, coming from the past, debauches into the present and thrusts ahead into possible futures. You could substitute sociologists for politicians, policy makers, a whole range of other key stakeholders. We tend to focus our attention on the problems of the here and now. The immediate problems, and studying youth really kind of pushes researchers and policymakers into the present. Whether you have a problem with um, youth violence or drug addiction, uh, whether it's employment or education or training, the tendency is to focus on the now, the present. What are the short-term solutions that we can introduce to solve these contemporary problems? But for me, that's problematic, really problematic. Social life is not lived in a snapshot. Um, I'm a big fan of instamatic or Polaroid photography, where you take the photo and it captures that point in time. Social life is not like that for me. Social life is more like a film. A film that has a beginning, a middle and an end. And so if we only focus our attention on two frames of that film, the here and now, the bit that concerns us, we miss 
all that's gone before and we miss the possibilities of what's to come next. We retreat not only into the present but into contemporary problems as though they are separate to the past, as though they are separate to what's gone before. Okay, So we need to take a longer term view. If we want to understand precarious employment and the challenges that that fate places at young people in the, or that young people face as a consequence of precarity, we need to understand how we got there. We need to ask that question, how did this come to be? And what are the issues that relate to that? I'd also say that we waste, we're very, uh, academics are very wasteful, policy makers are very wasteful. We constantly write and commission research, new research, focusing on the contemporary, focusing on current debates. Yet there are thousands and thousands of books, research reports and studies that have been written before what I call the dusty book jackets of studies past, which hide a veritable treasure trove of what was once state-of-the-art research, but which is now ignored. We've moved on. We forget all this that's gone before, and we assume simply because it was written 20, 30, 40, 100 years ago, it has no intellectual or va academic value. So this disregarding assumes that all studies of the past contain things that are old and useless. It's not simply a process of moving on, but something that myself and my co-author Henrietta have called the fetishization of the present, that, that occupation, that, that preoccupation with the here and now. And this is something peculiar in youth studies. It's the prioritisation of the contemporary at the expense of everything else. Now, I'll just qualify what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't commission new research and we shouldn't do research uh, on the issues that face people now. It's just that we need to understand how we've got to this point and the debates that we've encountered along the way. I'll give you one example. You can see in the image, that's a, a book written by one of my favourite authors, Pearl Jeffcott. Pearl Jeffcott wrote a book in the early 1960s on young people, race and violence. And it was set in Notting Hill in London. She wanted to understand the race riots that took place there. Again, it was around unemployment, around exploitation and about errant landlords. Let's fast forward to the contemporary. The, the research site for Jeffcott's work was the location of the Grenfell Tower tragedy, which I, I'm sure you'll be familiar with, the tower block that burnt down. Jeffcott, 40, 50 years earlier, had pointed to the problems with migration and errant landlords and, and so on and so forth. But her work disappeared into the past. So, what I talk about is we need to look back with intrigue. We need to look back and ask questions, contemporary questions, of past studies. Can they tell us something about our current state? What can we learn? So, I'll, I'll just pick this. When I started at Leicester as a, a PhD student in the early 90s, I was put in a really awful attic office. And in the attic office were hundreds of these interview schedules scattered all over the floor. And rather than doing what I was supposed to be doing, I spent all of my time reading these interview schedules of young people in Leicester in the 1960s. Their excitement of seeing the Beatles. Their excitement of leaving home for the first time. But it told another story. It told a story of complexity. We come back to Ken's story. 
everything that had been written about young people in that generation suggested that transitions were linear, transitions were straightforward, transitions uh, were careers for life, uncomplicated, often based around social reproduction, i.e. young people would tend to go into the jobs that their families had gone into. Yet when we looked at the data, we could see, as in Ken's case, the predictions that were made weren't true. That it's just that previous generations of researchers were not looking for those individual level complexities. They were trying to make broad predictions based on uh, you know, social class or the class of their parents or whatever it is. But when you looked at the individual stories which underpinned these lives, they were incredibly complicated. Unemployment, part-time work, temporary work, out work, so working at home, uh, and so on. So when we go back, we can see that the past was, is complex. In our work on making the precariat, I'll not show you, but likewise we found we got lots of interview schedules from the 1980s. And really, it dawned on us this idea of precarity is not new. It was just called different things in the past. Uh, Neoliberal governments like the one in the UK sold precariousness as entrepreneurship, being your own boss, carving your own way. Yet it had many of the characteristics of low pay, low skilled, uncertainty. What's changed, I think, we, we can see precariousness going back through time. Uh, go back to my favourite author, George Orwell. George Orwell, in Down and Out in Paris and London, writes about workers sitting in a coffee shop, waiting for the employer to come along and pick them out. The price of being in the coffee shop was one coffee for two hours. We fast forward to now, we have young people doing freelance work. Where do they do that work? Often in coffee shops with free internet and the price of which is a coffee. I don't know how long the coffee gets you. Again, this is not a simple analogy. I, I was speaking to a, um, a, a provider of, of entrepreneurial space, freelance space, and that's basically what they said. They could come and use the space, they just need to buy a coffee or they can stay here for a couple of hours. How have things changed from the 1930s? It's precarious, it's uncertain. I think it's become, uh, what we've written about is that it's become a new normality uh, for young people, for youth employment. I think the narrative around employment has changed to some extent. That you, know, you go back 10, 15 years and most economies and politicians were hanging on to this golden standard of full-time permanent careers for life. I think the reality for most young people now is that that may not be the case and that we need to understand what that experience is in order that we can support young people better. I'm just conscious of time so I will, I will speed up a little bit. We need to think creatively about how we research youth, and again, one, one of the best researchers in this respect is the unknown Pearl Jeffcott, who located her work in those biographies of young people. A lot's written today about problems of identity, problems of consumption, uh, issues around uh, belonging, issues around community for young people. Pearl was writing about exactly these issues 40 or so years ago, 50 years ago. In one of her books called Some Young Girls, she writes about the challenges that young females have in shaping an identity, forming relationships, behaving appropriately, leaving home, and so on. These debates are not new. We just periodically reinvent them um, in a you know, phrase, old, old wine in new bottles. But the wine's still the same. And then the last piece of work that we've been doing is on predicting the impacts of, 
of government interventions into uh, the training experience and employment experiences of young people. So again, in the 1980s, one of the um, major government interventions were the advent of youth training schemes. The idea that you would give people training and education and work experience and that that would somehow magically get them into work. It works for some people. It worked for some. We've looked at the career destinations of those people who participated in YTS. And if you were lucky enough to do a YTS scheme in, a, in, a, in an economy that was still growing, that was not reliant on heavy industry, that was not reliant on, on mining, for example, like in my own case, then you did fine. You got quality training, you got quality experience, you tended to get a job. If you happened to be in a different labour market, a declining labour market, a depressed labour market, then the quality of the training and the experience was largely useless. One of the things that we found from this research is the best predictor of future success for young people was having language qualifications at school. So English language is a better determinant of future career success than participation in any government training scheme. Now, governments, as I've said, are often um, keen to repeat the mistakes of the past. And so in the UK, we have this new scheme called Kickstart, which is essentially the same scheme that we had in the 1980s that will help some, but that won't help, help all. The problem of who? So I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a white English male and I'm stood here telling everybody the kind of problems of what it is to be a young person and that, that's really problematic. And I go back to Elias on this. Adult investigators are apt to investigate either their own problems with regard to young people or more generally the problems which adults experience so far as the younger generation is concerned not problems which confront and which are experienced by the younger generation themselves. Now, I will, uh, again, you know, I, I will be provocative. I will say this. We have an idea about employment. Governments have ideas about employment that are still perhaps rooted in this notion of full-time, permanent, career-oriented, job for life. The reality for many young people is that that's never going to be realistic. And that's, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. The new normal is this portfolio career. It's a problem for adults because it differs from what they've gone through. So at the heart of whatever we do, whether it's research, whether it's policy, whether it's government interventions, I think we need to heed the words of, of writers like Elias and put young people at the centre of the research. We need to take their concerns, young people's concerns, seriously. And that means we co-produce. We can't simply assume that because I think an issue, you know, as a you know, white middle-class English male, I think there's a particular set of issues. We can't assume that they are the issues that young people experience. I want to say a little bit about ordinary, ordinary kids and typical youth. Um, and many of us are, are guilty of this in, in academia. We're drawn to the spectacular. We're drawn to the problematic. But we also need to bear in mind that there are thousands of young people who are simply getting on with their lives. That they are simply getting on with it. And we need to also understand what the experience for them is like also. We tend, in policy terms and research terms, to focus on the kids that have failed, the problematic kids, the kids that are taking drugs, the kids that are involved in violent crime, whatever it is. But what about the rest? What about those ordinary, typical kids who simply get on with it? The problem of how we do this. One of the lessons that we can take 
from COVID as social researchers is that people, whether young or old, are less inclined to participate in traditional forms of research. They are less inclined to take part in surveys, less inclined to undertake interviews. Uh, these types of methods are relatively old-fashioned, kind of standard approaches to research. So we need, I think, to be more creative in what we do. I've talked about co-production of research with the young people involved, but we need to step back as researchers, as governments and as policy make makers, are the standard research tools sufficient to enable us to understand the experiences of young people now? I've argued, and I'll always argue, that we need to be creative in what we do. We need to be imaginative. It goes back to Mills and his sociological imagination. We need to think outside the box to make sure that we capture all the information that we need. And as I said at the start, we need to be holistic. We need to understand young people's lives ha as wholes. It's the problem of employment, the problem of housing, the problem of education, the problem of family, the problem of relationships, the problem generated by social media, the problem of resilience, the problem of mental health. These things are not separate. They are part of a set of processes which people experience, not in isolation from each other, but as a whole. So, I, you know, we need that um, holistic approach, not snapshots, as I've said. We don't need the photographs, we need that film. We need the film to understand. We're less interested in billiard ball causality, you know, playing snooker, you hit one ball, it hits another. X versus uh, X impacts on Y. Not interested in that. That implies that once you control one thing, everything else will be fine. And I'm not sure that's correct. So here's a picture from one of Pearl Jeffcott's books from the 1960s. I like it because the very cool dude in the picture has turn-ups on his jeans, so he's obviously incredibly fashionable like myself. But Jeffcott was ahead of her time. She moved away from standard research methodologies and used things like art to try and engage with young people to capture what they were experiencing, to capture more accurately the insights that they can give. And I think we can learn a lot. Again, we, we're going back to past studies, but we can learn a lot from things like this. We can, this picture tells us a lot about the social class of the individuals. I, I'll not talk too much about that. It's the mere fact that she used alternative means of capturing the information that we need that gives better insight. What better way to get a young person to explain the complexities of their lives than through art, imagery, poetry, literature. It doesn't necessarily need to be a survey. So reflections and conclusions. I've got two minutes left. So I think we need to take stock of where we are. We need to ask those questions about how we got here. If you really want to understand the problems posed by precarious working, you have to understand that precarious working did not start in 2008 as authors such as Guy Standing has suggested. They started a long time ago. They are inherent uh, within contemporary modes of production and ways of being. We have to look back and learn those experiences from previous generations. We have to think creatively. We have to engage young people in this process. And it's great, I can, there's lots of young people here. Um, again, I'm not saying that in a patronising way, I'm saying that as a kind of middle-aged English white male, that it's great to see the kind of enthusiasm for engaging with these kinds of debates. We have to have optimism. I want to finish on Ken. 
Ken's story is quite instructive. Ken didn't make the transitions that he was supposed to make. He didn't live out the working class career that he was supposed to do. But he did get a job. He had multiple jobs. He did start a family. He did have children, he had grandchildren. And he went on to have a house. And when I met him, he was incredibly happy. Incredibly happy. At the time, what was predicted for him was a life of drudgery and misery. And that didn't come true. So, have hope. Thank you.